Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you back to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me and if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without a greenhouse or grow lights or humidifiers. Just me and them growing either indoors or outdoors or not at all. So if that sounds like your kind of conditions, do hit subscribe, I post every week, but I am a complete amateur, so you must take everything I say with a grain of salt. And obviously everything I talk about is relative to my growing conditions, and there are many ways of growing orchids wherever you might be, but this is what I've discovered works for me, and it might be useful for you if you're in a similar type of climate, but plant lovers, ta-da, look at this fabulous lady slipper. So this is Cypripedium philip. Look at that. Oh. And plant lovers, it has been quite a journey to get to this point because this time last year, I had a flower spike and the bud was curling over, a bit like a poppy flower, and then it sort of opens. And just when the flowers at that point sort of curved over, exposing its neck, we had the most horrific hailstorm and a hailstone bashed the top and basically broke the plant's neck. So the bloom, never matured because the stalk was essentially snapped. So I got so far and it never opened. So as all things with orchids, you tend to have to wait 12 months for the cycle to repeat. And here we are, finally, it is mid spring in Australia and my Cypripedium has finally opened. So much to cover, so little time, but let's start at the beginning, perhaps Cypripedium. You know I'm a little bit of a fan of Latin and Greek botanizing. So Cypripedium, the pedium, so that's the same suffix as in Phragmopedium and Paphiopedalum, that pedly bit uh, means the same thing, which means essentially from Greek, slipper. And the Cypri bit is a reference to, well, is meaning Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty and love, who emerged from the ocean on the island of Cyprus in the Mediterranean, hence Cyprus, Chypre, yada, yada, yada. In fact, that's where the word copper comes from as well. Anyway, plant lovers, I happen to have spent my childhood in Cyprus, so I have a strong connection to Cypripedium. That's where the name comes from, hence the kind of common name, Lady Slipper, Aphrodite, Foot, Lady Slipper, that's where it all comes from. Anyway, this particular one is a hybrid called Philip, and it was created, I think, in the mid 90s. And it is a mega blend of two species orchids. And this is the amazing thing. So one of the orchids, Cypripedium macanthros, and that is an Asiatic orchid, which has the most enormous range. I'll show you on the map. It sort of stretches from Belarus and Russia all the way across above the Himalayas down to, and I think finally into Japan. So it's a huge range. And then the other species that was crossed to create our lovely Philip was Cypripedium kentuckiense. Guess where that comes from? Yes, basically around that part of Kentucky in the states that surround that part of the United States. So I find this amazing in terms of botany and continental drift that you have two completely very separate groups of plants that were still closely related enough to meet one dark and windy night and produce a fabulous offspring. Amazing. So that is the potted history of Cypripedium philip. One of the things people do say and write is that these hybrids are more vigorous and easier to grow than the species orchids. So that's something to bear in mind. So in the wild, these are essentially a woodland plant. Um, they are terrestrial and they are herbaceous perennial, which means they die down in winter and they go into dormancy and then they emerge in spring and they flower in late spring, set their seed, rinse and repeat, die down in autumn, the seeds will drop around it, they will probably sit on the surface of the leaf litter, which will protect them from bad weather, and then they will emerge in spring. And so that is a bit of a clue in terms of how you might want to grow it. Now I am growing mine in a terracotta pot because as you might know, I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy. A few places that I've read about these says, Ooh, they're very tricky to grow and very tricky to grow in pots. Proving that wrong. I think with this type of orchid, the best way to think of it is that it's a woodland perennial um, like anemones or erythroniums, plants like that. So they come from dappled woodland and you can imagine they mostly come from uh, deciduous forests. So they're going to get 
more spring light, but then as the leaves of the trees unfurl, they're gonna get more shade as the season progresses. So they'll be protected from bright, harsher sun as the season and the year moves on, but they will get quite a nice bit of warm, gentle spring sun. So in terms of growing them, that's kind of the best way to do it, I guess. If you're in the type of climatic zone where you can grow them outdoors, which would be a sort of a more of a cooler, temperate type of climate, I could grow them here outdoors, I think, here in Melbourne. Um, you would plant them as a woodland plant, essentially. So on the periphery of sort of deciduous trees or shrubs that you might have, so they'll get that um, spring light and then summer protection. And then like most of those sort of perennial woodland plants, they like a slightly more acidic soil. So let's talk potting. Now, again, I read many, many, many varying views about how to grow these orchids. Um, and in the end, I decided, you know what? I'm just gonna treat it like a herbaceous perennial. So in this pot is a mix of a regular out of the bag potting mix, but I also used a handful of a mix that's specific for rhododendrons and camellias. And you can usually get that in a separate small bag in garden centers. So it's slightly more acidic because those particular types of plants like a slightly more acidic soil. You know, the other thing that you can do to soil to make it a bit more acidic is mix in coffee grounds. Who knew, but there you go. So it's basically a regular potting mix with a little bit of that um, slightly acidic rhododendron slash camellia slash azalea potting mix mixed in, and then a little bit of perlite just to keep it nice and aerial and well drained. Because what you don't want is for these to get boggy and super wet because you might then rot the tubers. And then what I've done, and I'll show you, I'll do a close up of that, is that every spring, I just put a little, a little layer around the top of relatively well rotted leaf mulch and I just go and fossick under a deciduous bush, get a handful of it and just sprinkle it around the top. It sort of adds another layer of leaf mulch which these types of plants love because if you imagine plant lovers, they're growing in their foresty environs, they're going to get all that leaf litter that drops down every year. And if you want a bit more of an insight into how to grow a woodland perennial, I might link you to a video that I made on my other channel with Steve and Ryan. It's called The Horticulturalists. And we met a specialist grower of erythroniums. And she, in that video, her name is Jane Tonkin. She's a wonderful grower here in Melbourne. And she mixes together the ideal potting mix that she uses for woodland plants. And it's basically the same thing I would use for this. So I will link that above because she actually goes through the mixing of the potting mix. So it's quite useful. So for me then, in the pot, and I have this outside obviously all year because it is a plant that does like a, a winter chill. And obviously I'm in Melbourne, we don't get really, really cold winters. Our winters go down in the center of the city here very rarely do they go to zero degrees centigrade, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, very rarely. Gets close, one or two degrees centigrade, but not freezing. And we certainly rarely, if ever, and not in my last five years of experience, get frost in the inner city. The outer suburbs you certainly can, but not in inner city Melbourne. And one of these ancestors does grow across most of Russia and into Siberia, so it must get very cold winters. Anyway, it seems to be thriving in Melbourne's climate, which is fairly temperate, so not too cold and not crazy hot. But, of course, the thing is, in pot culture, is just to make sure it doesn't dry out. So it does come from areas with you know, pretty constant rainfall. So these are sort of moist, green, deciduous forests. So the rainfall is gonna be fairly consistent. Obviously, in summer here in Melbourne, we can go for fairly long periods without rain, and obviously anything growing in a pot is gonna need more water. So I'm not super focused on these. I have a lot of sort of unusual woodland perennial plants and I water them all at the same time, including this. So I just don't let them dry out. That's the bottom line during summer. And then in winter, I just let it fend for itself really because there's usually more than enough ambient rain to keep all of those pots um, moist. And so mine is sitting in a pot underneath the shade of actually a evergreen tree, which is not perfect, but there you go. It gives it plenty of shade in summer and it gets more dappled light in spring because I move the pot to a slightly sunnier spot and it's doing well. So food wise, I use a slow release fertilizer in the soil when I potted it. And then in spring, as I said, I do a topical application of sort of leaf mulch, leaf litter. And then I put a few sprinkles of a slow release fertilizer in it as well. And then maybe occasionally I will give everything outdoors a 
dose of a seaweed or a worm juice tonic, which is a tonic, not a fertilizer, just to you know give it a bit of a lift. But it's essentially outdoors, and um, and I know that there are worms in a lot of these pots, and worms don't damage the roots of plants, but they're very beneficial for the soil. They aerate it, and they're eating the the organic matter in the potting mix and turning it into the most amazingly fertile soil. So so there's kind of a version of a natural process going on. So I'm not that focused on the fertilizing, but it does get a dose once a year. And now the actual potting itself. So the plant comes in a tuber. So it's sort of like, like octopus tentacles and the point in the middle. Um, trying to think what you could compare it to, but I kind of can't think of anything. Anyway, it's a tuber. You basically lay it on the top of the soil that you've prepared and then cover it in a small layer of soil. So you really don't bury it. It's literally just covered. So for me, it was about a centimeter, which would be about half an inch, quarter of an inch of a layer of soft compost, leaf litter, etc. So you don't press it in, you don't really compact it, you just literally sort of gently cover it. Sprinkle on that your slow release fertilizer pellets. And of course, I added mycorrhizal fungi, water it in, leave it to do its business. And obviously, as these are deciduous plants, they are winter deciduous, the best time to plant them is autumn because they're in dormancy. So that's the easiest time, obviously, to ship tubers and to plant them. You would not want to be buying uh, a grown plant unless you were in a nursery where you could literally kind of carry it home. They're very fragile. So I wouldn't try and grow one that's emerged in spring summer. I would definitely wait till autumn, wherever you are, if you have access to them, to buy the tubers that way. Which brings us to availability. And I can tell you now, in Australia, incredibly hard to come by. Now I will link below where I bought mine from, which is very generous of me. It's a grower in New South Wales, which is the state where Sydney is, and she has a garden in the Blue Mountains. So that's quite a high elevation and much colder than Sydney. Sydney's subtropical, the Blue Mountains are temperate, and it can get snowy up there and frosty, so quite a different climate. And she grows all manner of rare and unusual perennials. It's called Lynn's rare plant. So I'll put the link below. Now, the thing is though, Lynn updates her website maybe every month during the dormancy period. She doesn't sell anything in summer, obviously it's too hot and everything's grown. So she tends to sell things during autumn, winter, spring, and she tends to then sell the, the root balls of the perennials that she's selling. So what you could do is sign up to her website and have a look. But she only ever had a couple of these and I just happened to log on early one morning and today out there it was. So never seen them since and whenever she does have them they sell out really quickly. So if you're in Australia I would maybe look at her website and wait for the sort of autumn, winter and see if any turn up. But if you're in the United States I would hazard a guess it's a lot easier to get this type of orchid than it is here in Australia. And I would say it would be the same in Britain but who knows. Definitely not one for the tropics, definitely one for my kind of climate, lucky me. So you need a cool winter and not subtropical, tropical summers. But then let's just talk about the flower. Firstly, isn't it the most enormous size? And then just the form of it and this, this extraordinary swollen part here. I mean, goodness me. It does look like it should be carnivorous and rip your finger off, but it's not. And apparently the pollination of this flower is actually quite tricky and the design of what's going on in here traps a particular sized in insect and forces it to exit the flower in a particular way, getting obviously covered in pollen and then visiting the next flower. But there aren't that many insects that apparently fit the bill. So um, the amount of seed that's set varies tremendously. So I'm curious that now that I finally got the plant to flower, I'm going to leave it outside and see what happens. But unfortunately, it doesn't have any friends. So I'm not sure if I would need to have another flower nearby for it to pollinate itself because I don't think these are self pollinators. Anyway, Philip might have to wait for a friend before it can have children. And these orchids can clump, um, but obviously seed distribution is going to be perhaps an easier way to get them to multiply and form a clump. But we'll see, we'll see. Most tuberous perennial plants are going to form larger clumps over time. So I hope that Philip does the same. But you can see with the flower, it's sort of a beautiful ivory, buttery yellow with these amazing pink striations all over it. The most incredible form. And you can see, obviously, how related the flower shape is to both Phragmopedium and Paphiopedilum. 
um, and how they all sort of s shared that generic common name of Lady Slipper. Very interesting. I am just really happy that this bloomed, given that everything I've read said, oh, they're so difficult, and it was not inexpensive. So I was a little worried that it might not come to anything. And I was devastated last year when hail snapped off or broke the neck of the flower. But here we are this year, it has bloomed. So there we are, plant lovers, Cypripedium philip. I am very happy it's in its terracotta pot. It actually has quite beautiful leaves too, doesn't it? They're very lovely leaves, I feel. Um, I'm just thrilled that it's bloomed and when we move into our new house I might plant it in the garden or I might just try and maintain it in pots. I'm not sure yet. It would all be about getting the right spot and then giving it space so that it's not going to be crowded out by other things when it uh, emerges in spring. So that's the other thing perhaps to remember if you're planting it in the garden is that if there is really dense ground covers nearby it's not going to thrive. So there we are. I am so delighted that the flowers opened and stayed long enough for me to show you as well. Look at that labellum, isn't it? Just the most bizarre thing you've ever seen. The labellum or lip is this bit and it's just enormous, isn't it? It's the size of a very large walnut. Such a bizarre looking flower, but there you go. And I do wonder about what the characteristics of those two crosses are. Um, Anyway, apparently hybrids are more vigorous and easier to grow than the two species, but I guess we've got perhaps hybrid vigor and color from some of the parents, who knows? The flower's been open about a week. Um, I'm not sure that it's gonna be a hugely long-lasting flower, but we'll see. Um, I would have imagined you'd get perhaps a couple of weeks out of it, so it's kind of a lot of effort for maybe not that much reward, because often orchid flowers can last for quite some time. You really want that, but... This one, I don't know. If you had an enormous number of them, it would be stunning and you'd probably get flowers opening at different times. So you might get say a month out of them all together, but mine, I don't know, but you know what? I don't care how long it lasts. It's just open and that makes me happy. So there we are, plant lovers. From Cypripedium, Philip and I, farewell. I hope you have a great week wherever you are. I do post every week on a Friday, so hit subscribe if you want to hear what my continuing amateurish adventure might be next week. But until then, we are going to say goodbye, take care, see you next week.